Torbjorn, okay? And I'm playing into a Widowmaker. I better not be sitting in the back and spamming. Then I generally want to get up and close to personal. I'm gonna get in there with my E, I'm gonna get in there with my turret, right? I'm gonna use my overload. My ultimate's really good up close, right? What if I'm playing versus dive composition? Because if I'm playing up close like I was versus, let's say, a, a Widowmaker into a Genji, it's gonna be way too easy for those heroes to do damage to me. So I need to be playing, not an, a Narnia, right? I'm not gonna play a million miles away because I don't think Tor would ever feel good at this range. But I'm gonna play, let's just say it's a benchmark outside of dash range, right? Or, you know, 15, 20, 25 meters away. Do you see, guys, how this completely changes how you play? And if you're not recognizing this in your games, you're probably positioning completely wrong. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about range, okay? So we have talked about range before, but it has been a dancing around it, explaining it, but without really getting into it. So if you guys don't know or you're, or you're new here, Grippy Stocks, thank you for some, so much for the sub. I'm a coach, I'm a pro coach, I'm a macro coach, I'm a micro coach, I'm a one-on-one -on -one coach, I've been doing this for a while. And as I've coached more and more, my philosophy of understanding the game has kind of evolved. And certain fundamental pillars of Overwatch that will help you no matter what hero you play have kind of come to light. So one of the fundamentals of Overwatch is uh, uh, angles, or let's just say map control. So angles, like controlling angles, and we'll just put angles because it's easy, but that's it's, it's really map control. Controlling powerful positions, can powerful off angles is a really, really important thing. Another one, maybe even more important than angles, is timing. So it's very important that you control the map. However, when you're playing the game of Overwatch, you have to be on your team's timing, doing something at the same time as your team. It's not just about being together with your team because you might be taking an angle, but you need to be synchronizing your pressure either on the enemy team or assisting somebody else in your team while they're going in, okay? So timing is crucial, angles is crucial. These are just the fundamentals of Overwatch. And then I had the third one, which is really the, the final one, and maybe the most important one of all, uh, and it's one that is ironically the least likely to see in most Overwatch play, because most Overwatch play isn't very coordinated, but uh, if you're able to coordinate it, it's great, and more often than not, uh, it is the most important thing and pro overwatch even semi pro overwatch or even if you're just on in a plat team scrimming right i don't know who subbed to me my activity feed is not updating but whoever did sub to me thank you so much i don't know if i'm just getting the, the, the notification now or what anyway long story short having a plan knowing what we're doing here what ultimate are we using what rotation are we doing everybody's on the same page not just with the timing but also what we're doing with that timing is super super crucial uh exclamation mark coaching will, will get you will get you to answer that question for you um so the fourth one and i'm gonna be honest with you guys this one was not up at the forefront for me for a long time i want to say up until a few months ago and this is how it happens as you study and learn more about the game you kind of formulate a different idea and this one is range okay and we're going to be talking about a really two things today um, but range is a really really big one now range is one of those things where it, it just makes totally obvious sense when you play the hero but if you're not actively thinking about it it's actually very easy to mess up now for example if i tell you guys about timing what is timing guys timing is just doing something at the same time as your team everybody understands that concept and everybody understands why it's important it makes sense if i'm a winston jumping in but my backline's not in a position to heal me or follow up or my damage is not in a position to follow up then my dive even if it's perfectly executed is bad it's a 1v5 right or even a 2v5 or a 3v5 it's still not properly timed now Range is another one of those where it seems so, duh, obviously, guys, but it's actually just as often as timing is messed up, range is messed up. Now, what is range in the context of Overwatch? In other words, what do I mean by that? So let me actually pull in the game here. Well, actually, <laughs> I'm going to reload Overwatch. So range is essentially when you look at your hero that you're playing, why are you playing the hero that you're playing? So one of the first questions I ask when I'm coaching somebody is what makes this hero strong? What is unique about this hero? And if I'm asking a, 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 that question to a Winston player, you dive, right? Okay, so Widowmaker player. Well, you're gonna snipe. You're gonna you're gonna shoot the enemy team, right? Uh, you think about a Junkrat. You think about a Reaper. You think about a Mercy, right? Uh, a lot of different heroes have a lot of different roles and a lot of different identities. But the common theme that ha applies to really almost every hero, I mean, really almost every hero, is the range at which they excel at. So if I go through, open up the practice range right now, 
And I ask you guys, what's the range for these heroes? Uh, what range does D.Va play at? Where is her effective range? Where does she actually do the most damage? And it usually comes back to damage, but it can also be like, how well do they heal? It's close range, right? Doomfist, close range. Junker Queen, mid, but mostly close range. Orisa, mid, close range. Ramatra, mid, long, and close range, but usually does better in close range. Reinhardt, very close range, right? Roadhog, mid to long range, right? Can do okay in close range, but generally his, his niche is more mid to long range. Sigma, can do close range, but more mid to long range. Winston, close range. Winston, uh, Wrecking Ball, excuse me, mid range and short range. Zarya, mid range and short range. Now you're gonna notice something, you're like, well, aren't all the tanks kind of mid to close range? Yes and no, but this is where it gets really interesting, okay? How does a Junker Queen play into a Reinhardt. Because we talk about Junker Queen as being a short range hero, right? But range is relative, guys. Listen to me. Range is relative. How does a Junker Queen play into a Reinhardt? Well, think about it. Because you talk about two theoretically short range heroes, but which one is going to do better at an actual melee range? Well, obviously Reinhardt, right? So then if we put on the range spectrum and you're playing Junker Queen into a Reinhardt, you play further than you normally would. Now let me extrapolate that one to Junker Queen versus Sigma. How does the Junker Queen generally want to play versus a Sigma? Close, right? Now Sigma can brawl with you, he can hit his rock and mess up your day, but you will do better versus a Sigma if you're able to get close and land your axe, land your carnage, right? That, so you see there's this is where the nuance comes into play. Now this is where it gets really complicated. How does an Orisa play versus a Junker Queen? Which one plays at range? Ah, oh, boy. Skits, do you think for the raid? You know what this is? So. This is a trash can. We're talking about one of the fundamentals of Overwatch, actually. So this, this is going to be very interesting for you. So those, those of you uh, who are interested in understanding range and how to play Overwatch, stay tuned. Thank you so much for the raid. So, if we're playing Junker Queen into Orisa, right? Does a Junker Queen want to get up close to an Orisa? Well, actually, yes, but it depends when. So, if I'm playing Orisa and a Junker Queen gets up and close to me, but I still have my Fortify, she's screwed. Right? Now, what if the Orisa doesn't have Fortify? Does a Junker Queen want to get up on her face and axe her and knife her and shoot her in the head? Yes, but it depends on her cooldown. Let's keep extrapolating here. You're playing Ramatra. Ramatra has his muscles. And I'm playing, let's say, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know. Let's keep going with the Orisa analogy here. And I'm playing Orisa. Do I want to get up close to Ramatra if he's got his muscles and let's say I do not have my Fortify? No, he's gonna ruin my day. Now I can block it with a, with a, with my javelin spin maybe, but it's not great. But like, let's say Ramatra does not have his muscles. This will generally do more damage than an Orisa doing this at range. So then I actually, as Orisa, I wanna close the distance. Do So it's very dependent upon the situation and the map and on the cooldowns. Holy crap, this is kind of complicated here. Now chat, the funny thing about this is this is only factoring in the 1v1. You're not even considering the DPS or the supports. So let me ask you a question right now. Is an Ash a mid-range, close-range, or a long-range hero? This one's pretty obvious, right? Sure, mid-range, long-range. Bastion, mid-close-ish, yeah. Now, we could go down the list here and find Genji's more of a short range hero, Hans is more of a long range hero, Mei's kind of nuanced, but generally more short range. Okay, let's let's not do all that though, because we've already did that with the tanks. You guys are smarter now, because we've talked about this already. So let's start right now. If I'm playing Ash versus a Genji, how do I want to play? Right? Obviously ranged, right? I don't want to give him dash or shuriken value by getting up close, right? Right. I'm playing Ash versus a Widowmaker. How do I play? Obviously short. All of a sudden, your sniper hero is no longer a sniper hero. You play it almost like a Reaper. Now I'm not saying you're gonna get an opportunity to get on top of the Widow, but if you could, you would ruin her day with Dynamite Coach Gun and your gun. 
You could take a duel with a Widowmaker if you're able to close the distance to what's better for you in comparison to the Widowmaker. So if I'm playing Ash, I generally, my best range versus most situations is something like this, right? But if I'm playing a Widowmaker, I might be more like this. I might play more like this, guys. And if I'm playing versus a Genji, maybe this isn't far enough. Maybe I want to be like this, right? Not absurdly far, but I want to be more like this. And then this is where <laughs> we go back to the Arisa and Ramatra example, where here's a question for you guys. If I'm playing Ash and I have my dynamite, maybe playing up close isn't the worst thing after all because dynamite does a lot of damage. Like even if I'm playing versus a Genji, if I can maybe catch him by surprise and I land a dynamite, now all of a sudden, my hero is not so bad up close. Do you see? Have a nice day. Now that you think about it, poke, dive, and brawl is literally defined by range. In fact, it's not defined just by range, but it's defined by the next thing, which we go to the pillars of Overwatch and watch what I'm going to do with my horrific Microsoft Paint. I'm going to draw a little line here, and we're going to add in a one more word. Ooh! We can't fit it, guys. And that's mobility. Because chat, the way Overwatch is balanced is based off of two things. Generally, it is mobility and range. Heroes with a lot of mobility generally don't have a lot of range. And heroes with a lot of range generally don't have a lot of ability and somewhere along uh, along the line. Now, how much damage does Dynamite do? Great question. So there's the initial blast. And each health bar is 25 HP, I believe. So it does about 150 damage, including the direct impact. But keep in mind that direct impact has thing. Now, <laughs> you guys in chat are saying Sojourn, Sojourn, Sojourn. And that's a great point. Because what Overwatch 2 has done is it's not just Sojourn. Hold on to your butt cheeks, okay? <laughs> it's not just Sojourn. What we've seen in Overwatch 1 was a very clear dynamic. Widowmaker, Tracer, Reinhardt, Winston, range close range mobility range mobility you go to overwatch 2 you have a mobile brawl tank with short range and long range look at ramatra ladies and gentlemen is ramatra a close range or a short range hero the answer is it depends and we've talked about this in my previous video a couple weeks ago. We talked about the Overwatch 2 hero design philosophy. Guys, if you go to the developer, uh, the, the dev diary, they talk about how they don't want as many hard counters. They want more nuanced, dynamic, and in a way, homogenized design. Where even a hero like Winston, what did Winston get, guys? Did he get more landing damage on his jump? No, he got a ranged zap gun. So every hero has range and mobility on a spectrum, but there are fewer outliers. And that's a very interesting point when we talk about Sojourn, right? Because Sojourn is that hero design philosophy encapsulated. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if it's balanced appropriately. The problem with Sojourn, and historically it was even worse, was that Sojourn with her E was the best short range hero in the game. Because initial E with the 200 damage, guys, you guys don't even remember alpha or early beta. Guys, E did 300 damage per second. It was absurd. So it was the best short range cooldown in the game. So you would destroy a Reaper in a 1v1 because you could throw your Sojourn at the floor and it was murder them, right? And Sojourn was one of the most if heroes, mobile heroes in the game because that mobility cooldown was on 5, 6 seconds, whatever. So she was crazy mobile crazy at short range and then obviously this is still to an extent the case but back then it was even more so where her spread wasn't near as bad and railgun was a one shot right and it was like a 280 damaged one shot as well so the problem with sojourn is not that she can do everything it's the problem that she could do everything better than heroes that are supposed to for example yes it's better than it used to be kind of sort of but back in the day a Sojourn was oftentimes better at dueling at long range than a Widowmaker. It took you longer to charge up a railgun, but the fact that you could do it while moving 80-80 strafing without having to stay scoped in and moving still meant that a Sojourn was actually ridiculously good at dueling Widows, and that's a problem. The Sojourn E initial strength and in making her so close to short range 
that's a problem. The fact that her shift was on such a low cooldown, so that she was highly mobile, even inarguably, even not inarguably, but arguably even more mobile than say a Genji, that was the problem. So it's not the problem that you have dynamics with the hero, whether they're range or short range, mid range, whatever. Thank you so much for the gifted sub. I appreciate it. Congratulations. It's the fact that you have these heroes that are dynamically strong, but are really good on both range, mobility, short, and long. That's the problem. And so when we talk about the pillars of Overwatch, we're not just talking about balance here, guys, by the way. We're talking about when you're playing the hero, you need to pay attention to the relative range of your hero to the enemy composition. Now, I'm not saying that this is a priority for a bronze player or a silver player or even necessarily a gold player, but it's definitely something that you need to consider. For example, if I'm playing Torbjorn, okay, and I'm playing into a Widowmaker, I better not be sitting in the back and spamming. At least anywhere that she can potentially see me, right? Because she's better at that range. Now, does that mean I can never play range? No, I can play range, but as long as she can't see me, right? You see me? You hear what I'm saying? So if I'm playing into a heavy spam comp as Torbjorn with a lot of range, now spam, what does spam mean? Usually means range, okay? Then I generally want to get up and close and personal. I'm gonna get in there with my E, I'm gonna get in there with my turret, right? I'm gonna use my overload. My ultimate's really good up close, right? Now, let me pivot something to something very, very reasonable, which is what if I'm playing versus dive composition, right? I hear a composition with Let's say, let's just let's just stereotype dive a little bit, okay? Genji Tracer, Sombra kind of sort of, Winston, Lucio's. They generally don't have a lot of range, right? Not a lot of range, okay? So then how do I position as a Torbjorn and to dive? Do you see, guys, how this completely changes how you play? And if you're not recognizing this in your games, you're probably positioning completely wrong. Because if I'm playing up close like I was versus, let's say, a, a Widowmaker into a Genji, it's going to be way too easy for those heroes to do damage to me. You see what I'm saying? So I need to be playing not an Narnia, right? I'm not going to play a million miles away because I don't think Tor would ever feel good at this range. But I'm going to play, let's just say it's a benchmark outside of dash range, right? Or, you know, 15, 20, 25 meters away. So this is why it's so important, guys, is because it completely shifts how you play each hero. Now, there are exceptions to the rule. Mercy is a tough one. Mercy doesn't really have a range. She's generally played with heroes that are more ranged because damage boost is generally more effective on those type of heroes, but she's a little bit more nuanced, right? Um, she's maybe a little bit more fragile and her G... Well, actually, you know what, chat? No, I'm wrong. Mercy absolutely has a range. Chat, let me ask you a question. Where is Mercy's range? Because pistol is irrelevant, right? We, we just spent a long time talking about that, right? But where is Mercy's range come from? I'm, I'm an idiot. I just now thought of this. <laughs> what ability benefits from range? Beam length, that's one thing, sure. So you can utilize your maximum beam range. But it goes beyond that. Chat, let me ask you a question. Is this an effective guardian angel? Right, you guys, you guys are getting it. Yep, you guys are getting it. Is this an effective guardian angel? Is that help me survive? No, not almost not at all. But if I'm being targeted here, and IGA here, is this helping me survive? Absolutely. So all of a sudden, even brain dead Spilo can come up with a range for Mercy, and then that affects when and where I play her. We talk about Mercy with Reinhardt compositions. Well, that's generally why Mercy doesn't do as well with Reinhardt. Now, if you're in gold, plat, don't let people tell you that Mercy doesn't work in lower, but when you get to the higher, higher top elos, that's why she doesn't feel as good, because Reinhardt compositions with short range heroes generally don't take off singles as much, right? So we can go down the list, guys. Ana can function and will want to function short range versus a Zenyatta because it's easier to land her shots, easier to land sleep dart, easier to land name. She doesn't want to pay a long spam worm versus a Zenyatta composition, right? But if you compare her to like a Brig, does, a, does an Ana want to get it close to a Brig composition usually? No, she wants to play like a quasi sniper. Um, uh, 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 Kiriko, Kiriko, very dynamic, can be short range, can be long range. 
That's, again, Overwatch 2 hero design philosophy. Now, the problem with Kiriko right now, what's the problem with Kiriko? Okay, if we ignore things like, okay, is Suzu strong, is whatever strong? Well, the problem with Kiriko is you look at the traditionally short-range healers in the game, like Moira or Batiste or even Ana and Lucio to an extent, and unfortunately, Kiriko does too much healing, too much short-range value with her Suzu to balance out for the fact that she also has good effective range with both her M1 and her teleport. And then you're not even factoring in her ultimate. So Kiriko's like Sojourn is broken, not because she has long range and short range dynamics and mobile dynamics, right? It's the fact that she does very well at all of them. She does too well at all of them. There needs to be more of a balance where if you have mobility, long range and short range, you're not the best at all of them. And that's the problem, okay? So let's keep going, guys. Tracer, very mobile hero. How is that balanced? What's her range? Does she have a lot of range? Does she even have a lot of range flexibility? Remember we talked about Ash, where Ash can play short, mid, and long range, right? But generally mid to long range. Tracer doesn't have that nuance. Tracer can play technically at mid range, but with reasonable mechanics, she's just not good at it. She's actually useless at long range. She's pretty weak in mid range. And so she's more of a short range flanker, right? And that's just how the hero is balanced. As I, I have like no mouse pad, y'all, so I'm moving around clunkily, okay? Same thing goes with Genji. We can describe Genji as a hero that has more range than Tracer, correct? He is able to do more damage at range than Tracer, right? However, if you compare that to his mobility, yes, he has things like wall climb and double jump, but generally Genji's mobility, he's not as mobile as Tracer, right? When you're playing Genji, you're not always necessarily on the back line versus a some comps especially. You're t playing mobile, playing off angles, playing high grounds, but you can't go as mobile as Tracer. So Tracer mobility wise is here, but Genji has the edge and range. So then you can see that in how the hero is designed and how the hero is balanced, right? Okay, uh, let's look at a hero like Soldier. Now, this is incredibly important to understand for heroes that are midway on the spectrum, okay? So for a Soldier, guys, this is a great question. Where does Soldier fall on the line? Where does Soldier fall on the range perspective? Where does Soldier fall on the mobility spectrum and range spectrum? Because let, let's actually start talking about both because really they, they, they're married together. They're, you can't really separate the two. Where does Soldier fall? Mobility and range. Mid at everything, yeah? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let me ask you a question. If I'm playing Soldier and I'm playing into a Tracer composition, what are the two things, what is the thing that I'm good at versus a Tracer composition that I need to be leveraging with my range? And then how do I utilize my mobility into a Tracer composition? This is a tough question. The range is pretty obvious, but the mobility one is, t is tough. What advantage do you have over a Tracer? How do you play versus a Tracer composition? I know we're looking at things in isolation. We're not considering what other heroes are playing besides Tracer, but let's start with that. Yeah, Helix Burst. Yeah, yeah, generally further away. Yeah, if I can keep a little bit of distance between myself and Tracer, even if that Tracer can blink on top of me, I'm forcing her to use blinks to get to me rather than having all of her blinks to, to juke with me. High ground, yeah, yeah, yeah. More, I, I, ironically, you win at point blank range, right? So so you have different ways of dealing. Remember the dynamite example with Ash? Usually you wanna play range versus Tracer, but you do have tools to deal with close range as long as you have your helix. So, generally play more range but there are exceptions to the rule now mobility is interesting if you're playing soldier into tracer listen carefully should you be really abusing your mobility and going hard flank all the time into a tracer comp usually and I'm, I'm, I'm talking broad terms here but just just think about it should you be taking hard flanks 24 7 as soldier into tracer why not why not you should still be taking some off angles, but why why should you not be hard flanking? Who is the advantage there, right? Right. So if Tracer, even if you ignore the fact that Tracer is better at 1v1s, the difference between Tracer and Soldier is that if Tracer starts to lose a 1v1 versus you, theoretically she should be able to escape you probably won't be able to. As mobile as you are, you probably won't be able to get escape. So Tracer, Soldier has more range flexibility than Tracer. So he has the advantage in that regard, but Tracer has more range or more mobility so that you have to consider that with how you position a Soldier. Now, this is crucial. 
chat, you're playing soldier into a Widowmaker. How do you position with your range and your mobility? Let's not let's not even break them down anymore. Let's combine both into you guys answer. Range and mobility. How do you play versus a Widowmaker? Flank. Yep. What about your range? So you don't want to meet her on her sightline. You want to abuse the fact that you have mobility because angles and flanks cause chaos. There's a higher chance of avoiding the tank and going for the squishy backline, right? Everybody would love to take flanks and angles, but they don't always have the mobility or self-sustain to do so. Soldier does. And especially if they're versus a Widowmaker, you could abuse the crap out of that. Medium to close? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you guys are nailing it, right? Okay. Now, this is where it gets so tricky, right? How do you play Soldier? versus a Cassidy composition, or let's say maybe an Ash, because the range there is, um, I would say maybe versus a Cassidy, you're a little bit better longer range, so you play longer range. So let's say Soldier versus Ash, okay? Soldier versus Ash. Mobility, range, Soldier versus Ash, how do you do it? Use your mobility, ooh. I'm gonna get to that one, the Corpu, because that's a great question. So if I'm playing versus an Ash, our ranges are similar. I do I would, would do a little bit better than her in close range, but she also has dynamite, so eh. But I definitely, I need to try and catch off guard. So I want to utilize flanks if I could. I have mobility, she has much weaker mobility. So I want to try and leverage that and surprise her, right? So that's where the ranges are very close, right? I think Ash has slightly longer range, but she's not bad in close range. So the difference isn't enough to really drive a big deal, but you have a big advantage in mobility. So you need to be leveraging it. You need to be leveraging that versus her most of the time. Now, again, I'm, I'm talking about this in a vacuum, but these are concepts that you guys can think about in your own ranked games and adjust your positioning accordingly. Now, the Corpu has a phenomenal question, which is really where we'll start to tie things up, at least a little bit, which is, what about when they have Widowmaker and Tracer? All right. Now, you guys have thought about this long enough, and you guys are smart enough. You tell me. What about when they have Widowmaker and Tracer? How do you, as a soldier, position then? Think about it. What's the solution? Because there is a solution. There is a solution. And let me give you a tip. Remember when we were talking about Orisa versus Ramatra, how... It depends on whether they have the cooldown or not, on whether Arissa wants to fight close to Ramatra or not, and vice versa. Does Ramatra want to take a brawl with Arissa? Does she have Fortify? Right? That's the question. So when we're considering dynamics and nuances, when they've got both range and mobility, how do you play with that? Got to get good? <laughs> That's one way to look at it. Swap to Sojourn. Brilliant. 8080 straight like mad because Soldier Hitbox is knowing to hit Ash. Wait for a Tracer to engage, then flank Widow. Ooh. So what you're saying is avoid the Tracer's flank entirely. So you're going to go flank on the Widowmaker, but you're going to do it in a location where Tracer is not. Brilliant idea. So you're going to be like, I know I can't beat Tracer on the flank. So I'm going to take a flank on the Widow because I need to, but not the Tracer's flank. Great idea. Phenomenal. Take cover from the Widow and deal with the Tracer. That's the opposite. You guys are literally on the same, uh, different sides of the same coin, where one of you is avoiding the Tracer, dealing with the Widow on the flank, and the other one is avoiding the Widow sight line and dealing with the Tracer at range. Do you see this? There it is, right there. That's it. You nailed it, right there. And it's that simple. So you either avoid the Tracer's flank and take the Widow duel on the flank where you have the advantage, because you have the advantage on the flank versus the Widow, or you avoid the Widow sightline and take the Tracer's fight at range where you have the advantage. You guys got it. Now, here's the thing. This sounds, like I said, a little esoteric, and a little bit complicated, but a lot of it is just kind of common sense, especially once you practice it in game. Because none of this is revolutionary ideas that aren't, haven't already been explored, but it's unbelievably underutilized. And I think something as simple as just thinking about the composition or the hero that you're playing into and adjusting your positioning to play to your strengths and not theirs is something that is not considered enough. And you guys just solved a really complicated conundrum, right? Because especially in Overwatch 2, when we consider heroes like Arissa and Ash and Bastion and, and, and Kiriko, the signature, I guess, of mobility and range isn't so clear. 
So you have to be smart at it. You have to be real smart. I remember when I was playing Arisa and ranked in season one, I was, you know, diving backlines or the Sigmas and such, and uh, you know, peeling off Winston's. But then they would play Zarya, and I would be like deer in headlights. I wouldn't know what to do because we'd both play in like the same range, but she'd just murder me. And then I finally realized that I can beat the ever living crap out of Zarya if she doesn't have bubbles. And then it goes back to the, if I, if I can find a way to force her bubble, I can win. If I can't, I can't win. And then I need to avoid the Zarya and take the 1v1 elsewhere. So guys, mobility and range is everything in Overwatch. And if you go down the list, you will find that heroes with a lot of mobility generally don't have a lot of flexibility with their range, right? A hero like Reaper has reasonable mobility, but he's very myopic, if that's, I'm not sure if that's the proper term, but he's very one-dimensional in terms of how his range is. It doesn't, there's not a lot of flexibility. Uh, you look at a hero like Sombra, uh, she's a little bit of an exception to the rule, but she's terrible at long range, right? Uh, and she's not as good at mid range either. So she's definitely a little bit more one dimensional, even though she has crazy mobility. Now, this doesn't explain everything, right? Uh, there are heroes that are strong, there are heroes that are weak, and there are heroes that aren't balanced perfectly well. But the reason why this is important is when you are a, uh, a Zenyatta player, and you are playing into a Widowmaker, you should never ever peek that Widowmaker, right? Uh, usually, right? Unless you're close to her. But if you're playing Zenyatta into most every other hero, generally range is your friend, and going on hard off angles 24 7 is not, right? Uh, at least in close range, right? And if you were to go on a flank, you would try and do so where there was a little bit of distance between you and the enemy team, right? The kick is more of a fail safe. It's not something that you want to be looking to try and pri utilize. Look at a hero like Hanzo, right? Or, or let's, let's, let's find something better than that. Let's say we're playing uh, uh, Batiste, right? Batiste is on the longer range for support, right? He wants to pressure the Junker Queen at range, Arissa at range. He wants to utilize his gun. He never really wants to get close to a tank. or anything. Nobody really wants to get close to a tank. But he wants to keep his distance from most heroes. But all of a sudden, you're playing Batiste into a Widowmaker or a Hanzo or an Ash or even a Sojourn with Railgun. Ooh, boy. I, I, I don't really want to be peeking those heroes, right? At range, right? That's the tricky thing. Any advice on making people use specific abilities? Uh, Widowhook or Kirikou Tip? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Can you rephrase it? Um, so basically the idea is that if you're playing into... Okay, let, let's let's finish it off with this one. So we're going to conclude the, our little segment with this because this is where we're going to like actually like wrap it all up here. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a theoretical composition and you guys are going to tell me how to play into it. So I am queued in and I'm say, I don't know, let's say I'm a Cassidy, okay? So Cassidy, I know he's not super meta right now, but just roll with it, all right? Get it? Okay. Uh, Cassidy, and the enemy composition is Arissa. I don't really know why I put the dash there, but whatever. Tracer. Uh, let's say Ash. Uh, Zen. Bat, how do you play Cassidy? How, not how do you play, but how do you position as Cassidy into this composition? Now, there's some things that are unequivocally the case. Cover always needs to be cover corners. That's all, regardless of whether you're playing range, short range, long range. But Cassidy, mobility wise, flank wise, and range, how do you play Cassidy into that? Um, Oh, like enemy abilities. Good positioning generally forces abilities that allow you to win the fight. So if I'm positioning well as a Cassidy, for example, I'm more likely to put out more damage. I'm more likely to force enemy abilities, and then I'm more likely to capitalize after them. Or if you're playing like a Winston, you would need to jump the Widowmaker to force her hook, but also in a way to where you're not going to take too much damage so that then you can pursue after that ability is used. Kind of a tricky question. Um, okay, so let, let's, let's think about this. Okay. Um... Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I understand that this is a pretty nuanced and difficult concept to kind of master, but remember the nice thing about this concepts, concepts like these in general, is that they're never not useful. So it's even if you don't fully understand it now, if you understand it a little bit and it makes you think a little bit more, you're going to benefit from it. And then when you get to gold and you get to plat, then you're going to understand it a little bit more. And you're gonna do, if this, is, this is something, guys, I coach this to Grandmaster and Overwatch League players, okay? This is something that we talk about with Overwatch League players, right? This is never not relevant. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about this. Get close to Ash and Zen. Brilliant. 
Brilliant. Close off angles. Flank up close against Ashton. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. As a Cassidy, I don't really want to be poking out at range versus these heroes, right? Um, I don't want to get, I don't want to, that, that these heroes really burn me up, especially that Ashton Zenyatta, right? So then what's the problem? Okay. Where's the nuance here? Because we said, I want to get up close to these heroes, right? Uh, and even, I guess, the Batiste as well. All right. So we'll put the Batiste in there. But what's the problem here? Because you guys are saying get close, get close, flank, uh, close off angles. What's the one nuance here that we have to consider as a Cassidy? The tracer peel is problematic, right? So if I go on an off angle or a flank and I run into a tracer as a Cassidy, I, uh, that that's rough. So does that mean I never ever take off angles as Cassidy versus a tracer? Well, no. But do you guys remember the soldier answer? Can you find an off angle? or a flank, or tracer is not. Can I avoid the tracer entirely? So where I don't have to end up dueling her, or can I get support, right, exactly, to where I'm more comfortable dealing with the tracer? Do you see what I'm saying? And the funny thing about that answer is that also applies to the Orissa. Now, Orissa is probably not likely gonna be flanking unless it's me on the Orissa. <laughs> That being said, I want to avoid the Orissa up close, right? Versus an Orissa, I'm more comfortable poking her out at range than I am getting up close to her. So then either I'm going to poke her out at range and abuse my range, but I need to avoid the Ashton Bap while I do that, or I'm going to go for the flank and utilize my mobility, and my job is to avoid the Tracer entirely. You see that? So either way, I want to avoid these guys up close, and on the flank, and I want to avoid these guys at range. Range, avoid, and then we'll just say up close, avoid. We don't want, we don't want these guys in, in close, let's just say short, and we don't want these guys in long. So what we need to do is we need to find a way to either take individual 1v1s or 2v1s, or just find some way to pressure at our effective range without going, whoops, close, short. We don't want to avoid these guys. Uh, long for us, right? We want long ranges versus these heroes and short ranges versus these heroes. Now, can't Orissa easily punish you when getting close? Right, so that's the thing. You cannot take Orissa up close. You cannot take a Tracer up close usually. Uh, it, it, it's way too scary. They're, they're, Orissa is definitely nuanced. She does have a little bit of poke, but she will beat the crap out of you if she's got any cooldown, right? Now, now here's the thing. Stalfo, so when you're saying my, I, it's hard for me because I'm used to hyper-focusing Tracer. Right, that's totally fine. That's totally fine. Um, but generally, when you're focusing the Tracer, you're trying to do so in a way that you can poke her out a little bit. Now, can you get up close and personal with a Tracer? Absolutely, absolutely. Cassidy's not only a long-range hero, guys. He's a very short-range hero as well, if he'd like, especially if you can land your sticky. Force a recall, force a couple of wings, totally worth it. But you have to, you need, you need to be really careful about it, right? You need to be really careful about it, all right? So here, here's the thing. And then I'm gonna use that to tie into our next point. Cassidy clearly needs to get up close to the ashes in. I, I think that's almost inarguable. Versus Tracer, eh, it's kind of nuanced, right? And versus even the Orissa, right? Do you want to poke out an Orissa at range or, or do you want to avoid her entirely? It's kind of nuanced. So this is where we tie into the last point because we've talked about a lot of complicated things that make things very difficult, okay? So then here's my question for you guys. You're a silver, gold, plat, diamond, even masters, whatever player, hearing this for the first time or considering this for the first time. This is a lot of things to consider. And the problem with learning is if you learn too much or you push yourself too much, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes and screw up a lot of ranked games and troll the lobby too much. It's gonna, it's not gonna even be fun learning. It's gonna be frustrating, trying to track all this at the same time. So then here's my question, chat. What is the simplest or easiest way to incorporate this and practice in your gameplay that's not going to completely overwhelm you and make you absolutely miserable? If I'm playing Ana or Zenyatta or Cassidy or Soldier or Tracer and I'm watching this right now, how do I implement this or start practicing this or start thinking about this without completely losing my mind and getting frustrated? And this might be the toughest question of all, but it's really important that we understand this. Just think about the range of the tab open, yes. 
but sometimes that can be really tricky, right? I mean, I mean, consider how long did it take us to figure out the Orisa, Tracer, Bat, Zen, Ash. That took a little bit of time, didn't it? Right? We had the luxury of sitting and just thinking about it for about 30, 45, 60 seconds. And then, then right? We don't have that luxury. So, ooh, 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 ooh. I, I like what PD, PDZ says, okay? So what PDZ is saying is we need to find the most relevant threats or just the most relevant enemies with the craziest range or mobility signatures for lack of a better term okay so if generally if i'm playing a ranked game and they're on widow i need to know that why because widowmaker is horrendously weak in some aspects and horrendously strong in some aspects and so that completely changes how i play the soldier good to know but he's kind of somewhere middle of the road widowmaker Holy crap, very far end of the spectrum with the range. I must know that. So Widowmaker is going to change how you play. Everybody knows that inherently, but if you actually think about it, you understand why. Now, let's go to our hero select screen, and you guys tell me, what are some really, 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 I would say almost caricatured heroes in Overwatch that are very, very mobile or very, very uh, range signature that are very good to know and adjust accordingly. What are heroes that don't have a lot of dynamics? Is a good good way of putting it. Because this is how you need to do it. You need to track one or two and, and just simplify it for yourself. Bastion, okay. Ball, okay. Ball, phenomenally mobile. Ball, it's really good to know that they're on ball because ball means that flanks and offing those are going to be very difficult reaper yes winston yes very mobile or very short range farah uh farah's a little bit trickier but sure yeah uh widowmaker right we talked about widowmaker already sombra right uh, uh junkrat very junkrat very very close range hero right uh um, um uh, sigma is a good one to know for example if i'm playing tank uh, specifically, and I'm now, does that mean you can't play range versus a Sigma? Of course not. But if I'm playing, for example, a tank, uh, Sigma is really the longest range tank in the game. So that really changes how I approach things, right? Doomfist, freakishly mobile, right? Zenyatta, freakishly ranged, usually. So what you would do is let's go back to our list here and let's create a composite here. So let's just throw in Reinhardt. Right. Oh, by the way, Reinhardt's another one y'all aren't thinking about. Reinhardt's very, very, uh, uh, very, very straightforward. He's fairly mobile now, but Ryan Cass, uh, Reaper, uh, Bap, Lucio. Chat, you are playing Junker Queen. Okay into the following composition. And you are playing it with, let's say, an Ash, Torb, Lucio, Kiriko. Now you are the Junker Queen. Look at the enemy comp, identify the two greatest outliers and tell me how you should play, how you should position. Again, we're looking at the most crazy outliers here. Who are our outliers? Let's let's start by identifying our outliers here, okay? Is Cassidy an outlier? Is Batiste an outlier? Ryan and Reaper, yeah, exactly, 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 guys, exactly, absolutely perfect. Ryan and Reaper, and you're playing Junker Queen. So how do you play versus, how do you position versus Ryan and Reaper? What range do you play? Avoid cast sightlines and mid-range. Yeah, exactly. So Cassidy's a little bit of a problem, right? Batiste is a little bit of a problem. But Ryan and Reaper are short-range heroes and nothing but short-range heroes. So you as a Junker Queen, where you are a little bit of both, you need to try and play a little bit of range. Does that mean you never get close to them? No, but you need to start poking them early and often. Put damage on that Ryan and Reaper as much as you can from a corner. And then if they get close to you, you either kite 
Or you make it so that by the time they get close to you, that Ryan has no shield, the Reaper has no wraith, and all of a sudden you could take the brawl right in front of their face because they don't have the cooldowns that make them excel at that range. Lucio is relevant, but I would say not as relevant. Remember, chat, we're trying to simplify it to where we can actually apply this in game, okay? Now, let's try this again, okay? So uh, we'll just get a new one, okay? Let's go back to our hero screen. And let's get let's get a sigma in here. Sigma. Let's just pick Sombra. I'm just gonna literally pick the first hero that I see. May. Uh, Brig. Uh, uh, let's do Mercy. Okay. So I'm I'm, listen, I'm we're making this real ranked comps, y'all. Okay, and you are playing Bastion. Bastion, Widow, uh, let's just do Ramatra, I'll change the scene in a second, with Moira, and Zen. <laughs> All real ranked comp hours, yeah. <coughs> Chat, you are the Bastio, apparently. Uh, you are the Bastion. Look at the enemy comp, who are the outliers? Mobility and range. Who are the outliers? Now, Brig's a tough one, isn't she? Now, I would say Brig is more of a nuanced hero because Brig has flail, yes, but her armor pack is a great ranged utility. So I don't think Brig is super one-dimensional, right? But who are the, who are the most... Who do you think are the, the real outliers here? May Sombra, Sigma, Mercy and Sombra... It's tough, isn't it, guys? This tough, this one, listen, I really truly just made this one up on the fly. I was not thinking about this one at all. But here's the thing. Some of you guys are saying May because generally more of a close range hero. However, she does have folk. Some of you are saying Mercy. Okay, more of a long range hero. However, you know, whatever, right? Some of you guys are saying Sigma because he's a very ranged tank. Whoops, my cat just jumped on my arm. But one thing that's coming up consistently is while there's indecision about the other one, we for sure know that this sucker is relevant. Because she has a very, very unique and caricatured, I guess, it's just a horrible term, but whatever, uh, extreme playstyle. She's going to be invisible. She's going to be in your backline. Uh, or uh, very much on the flank. So you as a Bastion, even if, let's, let's, just, let's just do the easy thing here. We're not going to consider me. We're not going to consider Sigma. We're, not gonna, we're just going to focus on one, not even two. Okay? How do you play into Sombra? Now... I understand that we have to consider things like hack and things like that. Let's shelve that for right now. Let's just consider it from just a mobility range, just from a positioning standpoint. Because remember, we're just talking about positioning here. So how do you play as Bastion, positionally wise, into this composition? Never play alone. Right, so you might take angles and flanks, but you need to be really careful that you don't get caught with your pants down versus a somber. Because if you get hacked and you're not in turret form, or even if you are in turret form, you're in, you're in trouble. So does that mean that you never take off angles and flanks, chat? Because some of you guys are saying play with your team and stay close to your team, and you're 100% correct. However, there's a little bit of nuance to that. Can you take flanks and angles versus a Sombra? And if so, how and when? Remember when we were talking about Soldier versus Tracer, right? And when Soldier could take a flank, but he had to take a flank where he could see the Tracer, right? Or he could get support. Be in support sightline, yes. What if you know, know where Sombra is? Flank mid-fight when Sombra just used Translocator? Great idea. Great idea. When you your Widow ults, for sure? Genius. Genius. What if you know where the Sombra is? You see her uncloaked in her own backline? Now the flank's open, isn't it? Now, when I say flank and angle, guys, I don't want to open up another can of worms. I'm not necessarily saying go all the way into the back line, right? What I'm saying is maybe your team is here, the enemy team is here, and you as a Bastion try and take like an extra angle off here, right? No, Not where it's totally isolated, right? But even something like this might be kind of risky if you don't know where Sombra is. But if you know where Sombra is, then this is less risky. So you guys see what I'm saying. There's a lot of nuance here, and I hope if nothing else, I've got you guys to think about this more. And remember, I really want to include that part at the end where we're actually considering how you can track this in a real-life scenario, 
or in a real game scenario where there's a lot of weird factors going on, but every single one of you, every single time, were able to identify the most relevant threats, whether it was the Ryan, the Reaper, or the Sombra. There was some disagreement with, with Sigma and May, but it doesn't really matter, right? Sombra was the big one. And that changes how you position as a DPS, as a support, and as a tank. Now, there are some things that are re re important re regardless. If I'm telling you, um, as a Bastion versus a Reaper May Ryan comp, you want to play range, but your team is spawn holding and not letting you play range. Playing with your team and around your team is more important than playing the specific micro detail that some random coach told you on Twitch. Right? There's some rules that are just more important than this. But this one is relevant enough and important enough to at least consider whenever you're positioning. And remember, chat, consider the outliers. And a good way, to, a good way to practice this is to assume that they're running the outliers from the get-go. If I'm playing Zenyatta on King's Row first defense, I can't press tab immediately. But I'm not shooting at their spawn doors, up top especially, right? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? As Zenyatta, because I assume they're on Widowmaker. I don't know that, but I assume that. And nor do I go off on crazy flanks on first defense, because I assume they're on Tracer, and I assume they're on Sombra. Right? I assume they're on Widow, Sombra, Tracer, Doomfist, with a Sigma, and, and a Lucio, Ryan, Reaper. Right? I assume everything. Always assume the worst. And then as soon as I see what they're on, oh shoot, they were on that Widowmaker, but they're on Widowmaker Hanzo with a bat. Then I'm like, hey, you know what I could do? And they'll say they're on a Sigma too, right? I could take angles or flanks on these guys. Not always, but if I want to take a flank or an angle... I'm okay. I got that option too. Because if they're going to play Widow, they're not playing Tracer. Oh shoot, they're on Tracer now? Okay, well I can play in Narnia and I can just spam these angles on. Right? So you see how that, that, that night and day adjusts how you position depending on, on those outliers, right? And remember, obviously, a lot of times there's going to be nuance, so that's why you find the most interesting. Now, if you guys were to play into an Orisa, Bap, Brig, Cassidy, May, <laughs> Unless you're on like a Widowmaker, right, or, or a Reaper, there's a, that's just smack dab mid in every possible way just about. Um, but most of the time, there's going to be an outlier in terms of mobility or short range or long range, and that's going to help you understand how to position a little bit easier. So I hope you guys learned something from that. And if nothing else, just remember that, yes, this is not something that's super, super easy to completely execute perfectly. Um, but it's something I highly recommend starting putting thought into because re it, remember, it's never not relevant.